Uh, well, welcome to the short lecture series on Thursday, the 11th, 11th of February, 2021. Our lecture today is by Richard Guy, who's going to talk about receding seas in relation to Earth expansion. And Richard is well known for his books on Earth expansion. Um, and here are just two. Um, we have the uh, Is Planet Earth Expanding? and the mysterious, mysterious receding seas. Uh, and I believe you, you've, got a, you've got about seven of them, I think, have you? So uh, I've got a few more. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll pass you over to Richard now and uh, hopefully we can start the lecture. Um, okay, oh, do, do, do you want to share your screen at all or, or are you just going to talk to us. No, I'm just going to talk to you. Can okay. you see me? Can you see me? Yes. Good. I'll say I'll talk because I'm reading from a manuscript beside the screen because I thought it was the only thing to keep the thing on time. So I'm sticking to the, the script. So, um, so go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Or, yeah. or Stephen. Um, the name of the talk is Receding Seas and Earth Expansion are Manifestations of the Same Phenomenon. Well, first of all, before going forward, as I mentioned before, I want to thank you, Stephen Hurrell, for keeping the Expanding Earth Dialogue alive and well over successive years. Also, thanks is due for the compilation of the collection of talks in the recently published book which you put forward in London last year. So thank you from all of us for keeping the thing alive. And this is how we have such interesting um, meetings and talks in, this, in the interim. So thank you. My aspect of my talks will be broken down as follows. When first did I become interested in earth as a subject? Who and wh what were my main influences? What is the main evidence that convinced me that Earth expansion was worth exploring further? What were the main events and interactions that formulated my thoughts about Earth expansion? And what sort of contacts have I made over the Earth, over, about, with Earth expansionists worldwide? And what are my final thoughts about Earth expansion today? <clears throat> The theory of my Earth expansion experiences for me was a rather prolonged gestation period. It was a life of connecting the dots over successive years, which really started back in my pre-elementary school days. I always loved geography and history, and I was always good at both. In the history books, I always noted that when maps were used to illustrate cities, that were always, there were always two lines along the shorelines of these cities. One of these lines would be indicating the current shoreline and the other was usually further inland, always depicting the old ancient shoreline. This was a consistent pattern in those history books, which gave me much food for thought. I pondered the significance of these two shorelines for many years. I always wondered why they had been depicted as such. After graduation from high school, I went on to study engineering. While working as an engineer in Britain, I was employed for a time with a large American company who built oil refineries around the world. During this time with them, I worked in the structural steel department on several refineries in Saudi Arabia, Suva, Bahrain, Trinidad, and Jamaica. I also worked on this refinery at Milford Haven, which was right on the seashore in Wales. Is everybody hearing me distinctly? Yep, excellent, thank you. Good. I was on the site at Milford Haven Refinery one Monday morning. I had taken a train down from London to attend one of the usual weekly site meetings. 
A part of the project was the building of a jetty for the oil tankers to dock and discharge the crude oil they brought to the refinery from the Middle East. After the site meeting, I was standing beside a foreman on the side, on the seaside, and by way of idle conversation, I said, we are putting up a lot of steel towers on the sea. I suppose that the sea will be rusting them away in a few years, the sea air, you know, the salt air. His response was worth its weight in gold, for what he said inserted another dot in the gestation period towards Earth expansion. His off-the-cuff observation on that Monday morning by the sea in Wales spoke volumes for the mystery that had fascinated me as a small boy looking at two seafronts in my history books. He proceeded to comment on my remark about steel rusting away on the seafront. And he said, Richard, don't worry about it because in time, the sea will move out from here. I pondered his remark for a moment and then how can you be so sure this will happen? Without any hesitation, he went on to explain what he meant. Without any hesitation, Richard, I live around here and I know the history of this locality. When the Romans ruled Britain, they built coastal roads all around the islands so they could move their army quickly from place to place. All the coastal roads they built along the coast of Wales 2000 years ago are now 22 miles inland. That was a moment of enlightenment. That was a ma major milestone in the genesis of Earth expansion. I was elated for I had finally solved the riddle of the two coastlines in my history books back in elementary school. I learned this classic piece of puzzle back in 1957 and I have been constantly on the lookout since then for anything that could take me further along in my quest. I have researched this same phenomenon in several places around the world, which have, which have been dealt with in my books. The effect of this sea level recession all around the world has led me to investigate ancient civilizations and their origins. This resulted in my third book, The Ascent of Man Downhill All the Way. In 1961, I returned to Jamaica, the problem never far from my thoughts. I decided I would revisit the beaches where I swam as a child, for I could do a comparison with sea levels back then and now. I was returning to the location after 30 years. When I was growing up, our entire family went to the beach every Sunday. We swam inside an enclosed area in the sea. The enclosure was piled around with wooden piles so that we could swim safely from the sharks that prowled in the harbor where we were. The sharks followed the ships that came into the harbor to eat any food thrown from the kitchens on board. So to swim outside of the enclosure was not safe. The enclosure had a walkway all around the top of the piles where you could walk in safety and dive off in the deep end of the walkway back into the enclosure. At that age, I could not swim. So my father would wade into the deep end and allow me to dive from the walkway and he would catch me when I came up. That way I developed confidence in the water with the assurance that my father would be there to catch me. Of course, my father was standing in water that was five feet deep, which allowed me to dive in safety. When I arrived at that beach today, 30 years later, the enclosure had all but disappeared. The walkway had been destroyed, but the piles that supported the walkway were still standing. And that immediately drew my attention. 
For where my father used to stand in five foot of water and let me dive, the water was now one foot deep. The sea had withdrawn over the years and dropped four feet in level. Now, uh, I was so elated at the observation that I took off my shoes and socks and waded out to the point where I could measure the height of the water where I used to dive. As I did this, I looked down in the water and was amazed to see for the first time in my life a seahorse. I'd always thought that seahorses were large animals the size of horses. I did not know that they were such small creatures. The seahorse was significant, for it was synonymous with me finding out that the receding seas was in reality, and the seahorses were just a few inches in height. I also decided to visit other locations where sea levels were etched in my childhood mind. King Street is the main street in Kingston, in Kingston the capital of Jamaica. The street runs through the heart of downtown Kingston to the harbor. As a child, I remember on several occasions driving with my father down King Street to the harbor. When it was high tide in the harbor, the water would flood the street as far inland as Harbor Street, which was two blocks away from the sea. So for the last 100 yards down to the harbor, we were driving through seawater. I went to the seawall and measured the water height. The water level did not rise high enough to flood the, steel, the, the street above anymore at high tide. It had dropped four feet. So what were my main influences? <clears throat> my father, without a doubt, was most influential and getting me interested in many subjects and, and enigmas. He was a practical engineer having worked for 13 years on the Panama Canal construction, where he was taught railroad construction by the American engineers. He evidently had a crisp, quick grasp of the technicalities for when he returned to Jamaica, the same engineering team, Americans, called him to work for them again in Honduras, in the jungles of Honduras, laying railroads. They called him again to build railroads in the mountains of Haiti into Santo Domingo. And evidently, uh, sorry, eventually they built railroads in Cuba where he held the post of superintendent of the railroads. My father told me of all the skeleton remains of whales and fishes he discovered while excavating in Panama, miles away from the sea. And he told me of the same phenomena being found in excavations in the mountains of Haiti, 2000 feet above sea level. My father told me about many engineering accomplishments such as the building of the great bridges. Another thing he told me about, which absorbed my interest for a long time, was the story of the laying of the transatlantic cables. One of the many things he said held my interest, and that was that after the cables were laid on the floor of the Atlantic, they kept snapping. Every time they snapped, it caused a lot of expensive repairs and disruptions of transatlantic cables. The experts of that era declared that on the sea turbidity currents and landslides was what caused the cables to snap. For some reason, I was a child, but I did not buy into that narrative. I could not see a sturdy cable being broken by an undersea landslide. Somehow, I remember thinking that that was not the reason. I must have been 10 years old at the time, but my father told me that story. But I remember thinking the reason was ridiculous. I often wondered why I felt that, but growing up on an island of Jamaica and having such a close relationship with the sea and swimming 
often you learn a lot from the sea. For instance, in years later, when I was deep in thought about the expanding earth, I remember something important. As boys, we would go to the beach early in the mornings and swim all day. When we arrived in the early morning, the water was very cold normally, but that did not discourage us from swimming. We knew that to get warm, all we had to do is dive in and go deep down to the bottom of the sea, for it was always warm down there. In later years, I knew this elementary truth when the argument surfaced that the earth was getting hotter, hence its expansion. I knew that as a small boy, we were far ahead of the curve. The year 1957 was declared the International Geographical Year, and I was, I, it was decided to survey the ocean floor with side sweep sonar. Such a survey had never been undertaken because they had no way of doing it. Side sweep sonar had been used and perfected during World War II. So now they had the technology. So they started the survey and that is when they discovered the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The ridge consists of two mountain ranges, one mile apart, running up the middle of the Atlantic. Prior to that, everyone thought that the ocean floor was level sand bed, not mountains. What had been happening was that the tiny cables were spanning a mile across the Gulf of the Middle Atlantic Ridge a mile on the water, and that is why they kept snapping. Since the discovery of the reason for the snapping cables, nothing more has ever been heard about on the sea landslides and turbidity currents. In that year, 1957, it was decided to carry out the Moho experiment. Scientists believe that the oldest sediments would be found in the middle of the Atlantic that would tell them about the origins and civiliza of civilizations and the Earth. They were going to take coarse samples from the mid-Atlantic sediment, and that would tell them all they wanted to know. The project went ahead as planned, but then the surprises started. There was no sediment in the mid-Atlantic. What they found was new sea floor coming up and spreading and pushing Europe away from North America by six feet every 60 years. So the Atlantic was getting wider and the process was continuous. What was the main evidence that convinced me that Earth expansion was worth exploring further? Each little snippet of information I obtained made my quest even more determined. I was on the lookout for any other dots in connecting the puzzle. I was working in Tucson, Arizona for a few years in the 70s. I started building houses and selling them on spec. I also brought land for housing development. The real estate law stipulated that if you built and sold more than five houses a year, you had to get a real estate license. So I enrolled in the real estate class to get my license. The first thing I learned was that the extent of the earth movement and growth in the Arizona Territory and Texas and across the vast expanse of the Southwest USA. The lecturer cited a legal battle that had been going on for years in Texas over a mile of land, which was growing between two ranches, and the, each rancher was laying claim to the land, but it still kept expanding. So the court case was ongoing for many years, but the mysterious thing about the land is that it was not on the map a, a couple of hundred years before. I was driving across the US from, o from Ohio to Arizona with my three children. And we stopped in El Paso for the weekend. 
The hotel in which we stayed had guided tours into wars, Mexico. So I enrolled myself and the kids to take the tour. We were crossing the international bridge into Mexico and the tour guide stopped in the middle of the bridge and pointed down to the land below and said, this piece of land under the bridge is expanding and they don't know the reason why. He continued that both the United States and Mexico have been disputing ownership of the land for many years because it's on the boundary between the United States and Mexico. Recently, however, however he said, Lyndon Johnson has signed it over to Mexico as a goodwill gesture. He ended up by saying that the land is now 600 feet and still expanding. Driving across the great Southwest of Arizona, California, down to Mexico, you can spot ancient carcasses of ships strewn across the desert, left behind by the receding sea hundreds of years ago. You also see strewn across the desert floor outcrops of pillar lava ejected from the earth when the sea covered the area. Over the years, as far as earth expansion is concerned, I have accumulated so much factual information that I've been able to write five books and still have material to write more and more or even more material come to light. I've also given lectures on the Oasis circuit in the United States on earth expansion and receding seas during the seventies. I myself have done my own investigations and experiments to test what I write and speak about. For example, having learned about the extent of earth movement and growth in the Southern Southwest, I've had ample opportunities to test the matter for myself. I brought a nine, people, nine acre parcel in Tucson for the purpose of development. I decided to accompany the surveyors to establish the accuracy of the boundaries. Not one of the corner pegs on the nine acres of land was where it's supposed to be. The entry road to the property was on the property next door and had to be corrected. It was nine feet out of its supposed location. At that time, I was also building low income houses for federal government. Each lot had to be identified by a survey to ensure that we were building on the right lot. Over a period of years, I built over 400 houses and not one of the lots ever closed correctly. They were always out. So I could reality attest to the fact that our earth was constantly moving and growing. I used to stop whenever I saw a surveyor working on a lot. Each lot had to be identified by a survey so that the title company would issue insurance to the bank and mortgage company that the lot had been identified officially. This was to assure the mortgage company that their investment was protected. Building on the wrong lot could cause endless litigation and loss to all concerned. I, all, I was intrigued for a long time with earth expansion, which is how I came to the other starting realization. I was one day on a hike through the Tucson mountains and I was pondering the problem as I walked. I asked myself the question, if the earth was really expanding, what manifestations could I look for to support that hypothesis? It was another eureka moment for me for the answer was revealed to me at that instant on the hillside in Arizona on that fateful Saturday morning years ago. The answer came clearly. If the earth is expanding, sea levels must fall. So there I had the question and the answer to what I needed to know so that I could speak and write with assurance having done the research. At that moment on the hillside in Arizona on the Saturday morning, I had the answer to a phenomenon that had been puzzling me for so many years of my life. I had researched sea level fall and had copious notes in my archives of what was happening in New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, to mention a few, year, a few areas on the East Coast. 
I attended the New York Public Library exhibition in 2008 entitled 300 Years of the New York Shoreline. The exhibition showed definitely that Manhattan and Brooklyn had grown a quarter mile of new shoreline in 300 years. There were photographs of the house of Captain Kidd located on the eastern end of Wall Street, which stopped at Pearl Street at the East River. Today, Pearl Street is one third of a mile from the East River and superseded by Water Street and the East Side Highway. On the west side of Manhattan, Broadway touched the Hudson three years ago, but today is a third of a mile away in the heart of Manhattan. The Twin Towers were built on reclaimed land from the Hudson and the United Nations building was built on 21 acres of reclaimed from the East River. Land is reclaimed in all harbors worldwide as soon as the seas recede and the foresh shore shallows. Southampton Harbor in Britain has had three successive harbors since the Middle Ages as the sea keeps getting, the sea keeps getting shallower making it impossible for large ships to negotiate. All harbors worldwide have to be constantly dressed as ships keep getting larger and need more depth while the sea keeps getting shallower. The problem of dredging plagued the Romans at Ostia, Puerto Romanos, 2000 years ago. The Romans had to abandon the harbor and build another one further along the coast. Today, when you fly out of Da Vinci Airport in Rome, you can see both harbors, but both of them are now three miles from the sea and 20 foot above sea level. What sort of contacts have I had with other Earth expansionists? I was contacted by the Expanding Earth magazine, which was established in 1980, California. They asked me to write articles on the first edition of the EE magazine, which I gladly agreed to do. The 12 contributors of the magazine were names that had international reputation from several countries worldwide. So I was honored to be asked. I wrote that I had deduced that the earth was expanding and as a result, the seas were receding. It was a simple treatise that embodied what I firmly believed. Among the contributors was Dr. Warren Carey, who wrote the book, The Expanding Earth. I was in the process of writing my book, which I intended to entitle The Expanding Earth. Dr. Carey, however, beat me to it. So I changed the title of my book to Is Planet Earth Expansion? Expanding. I, I, I have never wavered from what I wrote in the first edition and subsequent issues. And I still hold firm to the same concepts today, almost 40 years later. In fact, I'm more confirmed today than I was then with all the accumulated events I've compiled in support of the hypothesis. Altogether, I have never wavered from my original concept for years. I was in touch with the Expanding Earth Exchange and the contributors. And it got disbanded somewhere in the 80s and I've lost track of everybody. I was invited to the conference at the University of Pennsylvania in 2010. And, and I made a presentation there and also in Sicily in 2011. For years, I've corresponded with some of the members from the EEE, and then the site and the magazine went defunct. Defunct about the year 2000, I lost track of all the participants. What are my final thoughts on Earth expansion today? What puzzles me most of all is the fact that up to this point in time, the Earth expansion hypothesis has nothing but the rebuttals. We hear about global warming and sea level rise, which is antithesis to all the evidence that exists. Global warming has been touted in the press on a daily basis for years, and the hype seems intent in whipping up a frenzy of hysteria. 
I'm not a believer in conspiracy theories, but having observed this continued media hype, media hype, I've been forced to think that there's something sinister about the way in which the Earth expansion theory is negated at every utterance in favor of global expansion and rising seas. Uh, now, here is very interesting. Years ago, I read where the World Bank is dropping its lending criteria so that poor nations, what they call SIDS, there are 45 of them in the United Nations, poor nations can borrow their money at cheap rates to build coastal defenses against rising seas. I note that. Okay. So I got an email from a British civil servant in New Guinea who had read my book, The Mysterious Receding Seas. He emailed me to say that he agreed with what I wrote, that the seas were receding. He said he notices it everywhere on the coast of Borneo, where he works in the civil service. As he was a civil servant high up in the government, I told him to advise the government of Borneo not to borrow any money because the seas were not going to rise. He got back to me with the response, Richard, they don't want to hear anything from me for they are being offered the money at such concessionary rates that they are borrowing left, right, and center. It was then that I remembered what I had read years ago about the criteria being dropped by the World Bank to lend money to the small nations who have islands, the small island nations, the SIDS as they call them, 45 of them. We can now see the folly after all these 30 years, the seas are not rising, but the small island nations have to repay their loans. That are, there are 52 developing SID nations. But what's interesting, the, Se the Seychelles Islands, the Seychelles Islands, the Seychelles Islands, um, borrowed a lot of money and built, got Japan to build the coastal defenses. And now they found it's ruined the beaches because the sea has gone out and left the defenses behind. We should have discovered that all civilizations of the world developed downhill from the highest reaches of the mountain tops. We should have discovered all these things by now, except for the fact that we are being misled by Darwin when he observed what he termed raised beaches. He deduced that the land had reason because the sea was never a moot point. It was always at the same level. Agassi adopted his erroneous observation at least is isostatic rebound. Now we all know that the premise is wrong, all arguments arising therefrom are wrong. So here I, I say that Darwin was wrong and hence Agassi was also wrong. And here we are, after, we are almost 200 years later laboring the same Darwinian illusion that sea levels are a constant. So we are in a time warp of ignorance for we know the earth is expanding and we see cracks appearing everywhere on Earth, and we still propose subduction to justify Earth expansion. So, in fact, we have learned nothing over 200 years. I have laid out my case with several authentic observations without a shadow of a doubt that the seas are receding, and I've been doing so for millions of years. Therefore, find it impossible to overlook such conclusive examples documented over a lifetime and in the process find it impossible to ever understand how or why this simple fact has not been adopted by the pundits. They continue to figment elaborate theories that defy belief in the face of simple observation fact. If you don't comprehend what I've said in half an hour, I think I wasted my time. So thanks everybody for listening. I would like to hear from you if you enjoyed the talk so much. Uh, Richard Guy, my email is richardguy9 at gmail.com. Richardguy9 at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stephen. And um, I now signed off and leave the floor to you. Well, thank you Stephen, very much, Richard. Uh, excellent talk. <clears throat>
I, I can certainly confirm about uh, what you were saying about the about the uh, Welsh roads and also the Welsh castles, which um, which are actually miles away from the sea at the moment. And uh, the, it, 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 I mean, even in the Middle Ages, the boats used to come up to the castles and apparently unload uh, all the stores uh, onto the castles. And 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 now they're miles away. Um, and also Chester as well. We, if we go into Chester, we can see where the uh, we're, we're actually the uh, Romans uh, used to be able to bring ships in right up into Chester, and they can no longer do that. So, 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 so certainly, certainly around my area, uh, the seas seem to have gone back in in the last thousand years or so. Um, so, I, I don't know. Does anybody else have any comment or questions for Richard? I think everybody's satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just like to make a couple of comments. First, um, uh, excellent talk. And I, I agree about the recent uh, rec recession of the seas. And we're talking in historical time, not geological time. But in geological time, at least in, I'm most familiar with Western North America, uh, it's obvious that Western North America was often underwater, you know, massive cliffs of, of limestone in Montana and all up and down the Rocky Mountains. And even as recently as the Cretaceous when there was an inland sea. So the sea level was certainly much higher then. Um, okay, so those two seem to be in line. On the other hand, one of the arguments against expansion is that if the earth is expanding, the ocean the, 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 the ocean basins should be essentially empty, no water, because as the surface area increases and if water is constant, it's going to drop, drop, drop to very low levels. And this is a principal argument against uh, expansion by people who don't agree with it, saying that where, where did the water come from? I mean, it, obviously, there has to be more water to fill the expanding ocean basins. So on that score, the theory is that as, as new crust is formed in the ocean basins, new water is introduced as well from the mantle. So that the, that the crust increases in area and volume, and so does the total volume of the world's ocean. So there's a trade-off between the recession of ex caused by ex expansion, the recession of the seas caused by expansion, and the necessity to add new water to the ocean basins to keep the freeboard, as they call it, relatively constant. And it seems to be that the freeboard stays within a couple hundred meters, or give or take, uh, over geological time. So I'm just... I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm just pointing out that it's a very complex interplay between uh, expansion in increased ocean basin size and then also the need to introduce new water. And then also recognizing that the oceans are currently receding and it, like since Roman times and probably much longer than that. So that's, that's all, the only comment I wanted to make. Uh, Bill? Um, yes. I appreciate your comment, and I quite understand it. Now, the thing is this. The reality, I think, deals with... Um, I Whenever I open my mouth about biblical times, <laughs> I get... If you read Psalm 104, it gives you the depiction of the expansion of the earth. Psalm 104, number one. Number two, if you um, read a history about, for instance... Noah and his ark. Noah and his ark could be any analogy to a spaceship landing with animals to inhabit the earth. But then we have to remember that Noah landed in an ark at 16,900 feet above sea level today. And within, when he left the ark, his family followed the downward decline of the ocean to the point where it landed them at Nineveh. And Nineveh is a thousand feet above sea level today. Then in later years, Nineveh 
died a natural death and they went on to Babylon, lower down the river valley. Today, Babylon is 400 miles from the sea. Then later on, they went down to Ur of the Chaldees, which was a bustling seaport on the Persian Gulf. It's now 250 miles from the sea and so on and so forth. So it's the history of civilizations, which I featured in my book, The Ascent of Man Downhill All the Way. He followed the sea downhill. All right. So I appreciate your, um, your points made and um, everybody's entitled. So that is how I rest my case on my book. And at the same time, my explanation for the receding seas is that they just keep, mark you, in North America here, there are examples of the large, there was a large lake once upon a time, which encompassed all the land of, and which covered all the land up in the north here. And as years went on, it ebbed and ebbed and ebbed to the point where um, it's, um, we, it's, it, we ended up with the five great lakes. And what's interesting, I gave a lecture at Rotary Club some years ago about my book, The Seeding Seas. And um, at the end of it, uh, a gentleman came up to my podium and says, I appreciate your talk, I enjoyed it. And I just want to say, I'm from Sweden. And some years ago, I was building a shed in my backyard. And I came across the skeletal remains of a blue whale 25 miles from the sea. All right, these little incidents occur. I was able to tell him about more incidents I've written about in Sweden, about fishing villages that are now 125 miles inland. Um, so it, it, it's, it's just an interesting theory all around. As long as we keep thinking, we'll emerge with theories. So keep thinking, gentlemen. <laughs> Stephen, back to you. If I could, one other thing about the the recent recession of the of the seas, uh, and we're talking in human historical time, say ten thousand years or so. If if uh, the Earth, if during the glacial age, the sea level should have receded, should have dropped because all that water was sucked up by the by the polar ice caps. And as that melts, sea levels should be rising. And, and as they think nowadays with global warming, it's rising. But as you point out that in historical time, the, the coastlines are moving further and further outward, away from the ancient coastlines, like you mentioned, Ostia and Rome and so forth. So that's a contradiction between within their own thinking, because the ice cap that existed during the ice age should have significantly lowered sea levels, for example, allowing the Bering Strait to be closed so that, you know, Native Americans could migrate from Siberia. And yet uh, we see historically that the sea level is dropping when it should be rising. Well, Bill, that's a very interesting an analogy there. Because uh, as an engineer working in the north of Canada, meaning literally in the Arctic Circle, I've had ample opportunities to visit the North and it's, it's shaken my faith in the ice, ice theories because I, I can see all the people living those thousands of years ago. They have underground houses up by the Barren Sea in the Arctic Circle. They lived underground. Now then, how can you live on the ground with the ice three miles thick above your head? If you can explain that to me, then you have a convinced person. But the point is this, it's happened all over. Right today in the Yukon, they discovered something pre-ice age and all the houses are founded in land. They're not in ice and not living on top of ice shacks. All the Ice Age houses are founded inland. Okay, that's just a notification I unearthed. 
and I see it all over the north here, people living on the ground. Imagine that in the ice age, people are living under three miles of ice on the ground. No, no, there's something wrong there. Okay, I've, I've spoken. <laughs> okay, we, we have a, a question from uh, Dominique uh, Cartona as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll just read this out um, for you. Um, I was rather skeptical to the idea of receding seas, but there are studies that put generally accepted theory of rising seas in doubt. Uh, and then the, there's, there's actually a link to the, uh, to the paper, uh, Pacific sea levels rising very slowly and not accelerating. Um, but still, have doubts because many coastal areas, especially in recent years, have declined. Jakarta, Ind Indonesia, Bangladesh. Uh, can you explain it? I, I, I presume uh, you, you're talking about how explaining the rising sea levels in uh, Jakarta and Bangladesh there, are you, um, Dominique? Is that a question to me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 that's no, the oh, Richard. Oh, yeah. Yes, the thing is this, that um, there are localized phenomena that occur. In other words, um, okay, okay. Take, for instance, Chesapeake Bay in the United States. If you read Michener's novels, which I've read all of them, he mentioned, and Mark, Michener has been dead 30, 40 years, and his novels predated him about another hundred. But if you read the one about Chesapeake Bay, you will read where I forget the island, Smith Island or something is sinking into the Chesapeake. Subsequent to that, I read about another island that's sinking into the Chesapeake. And each time a great fuss is made about these individual islands that are sinking into the Chesapeake. And um, the Chesapeake Bay is an earthquake fault. It's tearing itself away from the United States continent. And all the islands in Chesapeake Bay are sinking. But they seek one out and feature it before it sinks. And another, but hundreds of islands in the Chesapeake Bay are all sinking because they're in the middle of an earthquake fault. So that's just one, anal one analogy that I can bring forward where uh, situations like these are seized upon us. See, see, the sea, the sea is rising, the sea is rising. No, 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 the island is sinking. So there again, is cause for examination of the argument and sussing it out for yourself. So that's my take on it. Okay, Stephen, back to you. If I could, I clicked on the link that Dominic posted there. And it's, that paper is co-authored by Clifford Ollier. And as you, most of us know, he's very sympathetic to earth expansion. I would say he's a pro, but I don't want to get him in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yes, that's a good observation. I, uh, I, uh, I missed the fact that uh, Cliff had uh, actually co-authored that one. Yes. Um, yes, of course, he, 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 I mean, Cliff has actually written quite a bit about um, actually how mountains form, hasn't he? So, uh, you know he's he's very keen on that, and he's he's written he's written a whole book about um, how how the mountains are actually forming uh, in in the interior of a continent, which which really plate tectonics doesn't really explain, does it? I mean I mean uh, the the fact that there are actually mountains in 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 the middle of uh, a continent is is it's not can't really be explained by the fact that. Uh, the, the continents are actually moving and colliding together because the mountains should be formed at the edge of the 
continent and and, and not right in the interior. So right. Uh... Uh, plate tectonics really should be called edge tectonics because <laughs> it, all, all of the actions should be taking at plate taking place at plate boundaries. Yeah. And when we have things happen in the interior of a, mm. of a stable craton, say North America, uh, it, it's difficult to explain. And the famous one here in North America is the Laramide orogeny uh, from the late Cretaceous to the early tertiary. Uh, that happens as far, you know, 600 miles or more to actually 2000 miles, I think it is mm. from the Pacific margin, which, and that was presumed, that, you know, the thinking is it was all caused by subduction. And the way they get around that is they say, oh, it was flat subduction. It didn't go down like this, you know, like that, like it's depicted, but it went down and then kind of went like that and then scraped along the bottom of the crust. Mm -hmm. So they have all sorts of little ad hoc modifications of the fundamental theory, which is subduction to explain these anomalous facts. And that's a perfect example of it. And mm -hmm. speaking of Cliff, he's, he's essentially a geomorphologist who, who applies his understanding of landforms and the distribution of ri how rivers develop and so forth to the problems of geology and tectonics. And he's got a very interesting and kind of a very broad perspective on these things. Well, Bill, following on that, um, okay, let's look at something now. Pillar lava is ejected under the sea. On uh, Mount Ararat is snow covered, but if the snow is removed, there is pillar lava at 16,900 feet. <laughs> Mount Kilimanjaro is 19,000 feet in Africa. And the top of it is encrusted in pillar lava, ejected <laughs> when the oceans covered the mountains. All the mountains around the earth. As I said, if you read Psalm 104, it tells you the whole story. I mean, I'm not being a religious freak. No, no, no. But I just love my theory as I, I research it. And Psalm 104 gives me a lot of support. Read it, and it will tell you about the mountains of the world. And at the same time, the edge theory, perhaps, yes, good, but mountains were there under the sea when they're formed and they well lava ejection on the, the sea everywhere across the desert i've driven in california you can see lava all across i've stopped the car many times just to touch them so that i can say i touched the lava that was once under the sea and right beside it there's a there's a um a little sign saying you are driving 1300 feet below sea level in ancient times in California, and the desert is dry. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, uh, I've seen a lot of things that just by virtue of being there, and it's interesting. So um, the mountains were under the sea when they, the volcanoes erupted and the lava spewed out. Pillar lava. Okay, uh, back to you again, Stephen. Yeah, and if I, uh, the Colorado Plateau, two or 3,000 feet above sea level, this is the, the iconic John Wayne Western landscape with the great mesas and buttes. All that rock is sedimentary, which means it was deposited underwater in exactly. marine, not lakes. I mean, uh, under seas, saltwater, presumably. So, and that's 2,000 feet above sea level now and rising. This is a big mystery in North American geology. Why is the Colorado Plateau rising? And, uh, <laughs> it's well, because the sea is going down. Well, they, yeah. <laughs> well, they well, come, lots of different theories, but all within the paradigm. The sea uh, going down, the receding sea solves a lot of theories. Anyway, yeah. you just mentioned Colorado. If you go past, if you drive past Denver, Colorado, the capital, um, Denver, it's, it's called a mile high city because it's 5,800 feet exactly to the floor of the, 
of the um, city hall, which I have been to. And um, I also had a chance to visit the lake, oh my gosh, the lake shore, showing dinosaur footprints around an ancient sea at 6,000 feet, which is a thousand feet above Denver. They had this lake edge shown. It was featured, I think, in Time Magazine some years ago about the dinosaurs walking around this ancient sea, which has long disappeared. And Denver now is below it, and below it comes the Grand Canyon and everything. But that was a sea where the sea was in those days, and the dinosaurs lived. So there you are, Stephen. That's something interesting for your... <laughs> Mm. Wait, wait. Well, of course, most fossils are, are actually um, a, a great majority of them. Uh, they actually fossilize actually under the sea. So uh, quite, quite a few dinosaurs exactly. have been swept yeah, out I, into the sea. And we, where we find them now is actually on land. But that used to be an ancient sea. And so, 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 certainly North America. I mean, I mean, during the Cretaceous, quite a bit of that was sea, wasn't it? Uh, you know, so uh, and and it it's similar all over the world. So, so, so we we need we need to sort of try and work out: is the land going up and down, or is the sea going somehow going up and down? And and how do we measure everything? I, th uh, I think Stephen, that the thing is an ongoing process. Mm. The sea is constantly, uh, Mark, this is my view, but sea is constantly going down. Oh, but, well, let me just um, pause to tell about another situation up in Denver, Colorado. The, one of the attractions up there is Dinosaur Valley, where hundreds of, of um, carcasses of dinosaurs were huddled in this valley. Now then, the Ancient sea disappeared gradually, and these animals gravitated to the deepest sea gradually as the water disappeared. And then eventually the deepest water was where Dinosaur Valley was today. And they huddled and huddled and huddled into eternity because in truth and in fact, they died in that valley en masse because the water was no longer there. So Dinosaur Valley is where they dig for all the skeletons of the dinosaurs in Colorado. And that's how it was provided. The sea just deserted the deepest water eventually. And that was where the dinosaurs are. So, so gentlemen, it's just interesting conversations. Any way you take it, it's just a matter of how you think and how the thinking goes in particular. But my forte is that the sea is constantly receding. It will one day go dry. That's another thing. Um, uh, God, before he um, left us some time ago from Cambridge, he said um, that in 4,000 years, the sea will disappear, the water will disappear, and man must have found alternative dwelling places by then. Uh, Stephen Hawkins, Stephen Hawkins. He wrote a thesis on that before he died. So um, the water is disappearing. And by the way, I'm a Jamaican and Jamaica is known as the land of wood and water. No longer, no longer the water. Years ago, I won a contract to do a new, a new reservoir. And the, the Water Commission says, we don't need it. We don't need it. Well, they needed it because we are running out of water. The city had to literally close down because there was no water in Kingston. And um, they're solving it just gradually over the island. And the water is, we have lost 100 rivers in 100 years. So the water is disappearing. And the mm. beautiful, so, okay, I won't ramble on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, another problem is we've, we have juvenile water that's supposed to be coming in at the mid-ocean ridges, isn't it? So 
So I mean, mean, what does everybody think about the juvenile water? Is 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 that really new water that is coming in, or is it is it just being recirculated round from, from from the oceans? Well, I think the conventional accepted theory is that it's recycled. Recycled. Well, Yes, but uh, as you know, they've discovered massive amounts of water in the mantle, uh, bridgmanite and, and minerals like that that are supposedly uh, anhydrous, have up to 2% by weight percent of water. And we're talking about 90% of the mantle. So uh, there's estimates that the, that the amount of water that's in the mantle is anywhere from five to 50 times the volume of water that's on the surface. So, it, and this is, comes back to the problem of with expansion, you should have had no, not enough water to fill the ocean basins. Where did mm -hmm. that water come from? Yeah. And it, it's, you know, probably comes. And then we have on top of that, the theory, uh, Eichler's theory of uh, the pla solar wind and plasma. And that's yeah. going to introduce water because that's pumping protons into the earth. Mm -hmm. And proton is a hydrogen atom, you know. Yes. Uh, I'm a, a proton, yeah. a hydrogen ion, and all you need is oxygen, and there's plenty of oxygen in the earth, silicate rocks, or I can't remember what the fraction of the earth that's oxygen, I think it's somewhere like 20 or 30 percent, mm -hmm. so um, this is a very complex issue, uh, tra there's, there's offsetting things going on, if earth is expanding, yes, causing sea level to decline, yes, but as Earth is expanding and new mantle material is, is being exposed in the, in the oceans, like you mentioned, at, in the seafloor ridges with the black smokers and so forth, water is also being introduced from the mantle. <laughs> but wa but water is being introduced into the mantle from the solar wind. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's got there. This is a very complex system. Yeah. And uh, you can't just to come down to one simple, you know, either or type of solution it's, it's got to be it's a complex system that's all you, you can say about it it is it is complex yeah yeah oh. oh and uh dominic also has a another comment that i'll i'll read out here uh richard and others also interesting is the difference between what tidal gauges show and what uh, satellite measurements show. Do you know about that? What do you think on space geodesity? Why is it wrong, if so? Well, tidal gauges worldwide vary. The sea levels around the world vary by 100 feet, if as much or more. And um, the gauge level in Britain, uh, which you call a uh, water level, mean sea level in Britain, mean sea level on the continent, mean sea level in North America, they're all different, at different levels. And they vary as you go around the world. The sea is not level. So, um, now, from space, uh, it has been conflicted. My daughter's a survey, and some years ago I attended a lecture in Arizona um, put on by the um, um, surveys, and they were disputing the ability to take levels on Earth from space because of the clarity, the, um, the differential, I hear they have rectified it since then, but there was a differential in that space to earth measurement of 16 feet, which was inconclusive in any real fine leveling to be done. I don't know much about it, but I remember my daughter attended and she asked, she's so, she's asked, um, the man, how, I forget the question, she asked the man in, who gave the lecture. But at the end of it, when they were having drinks in the back room, the guy approached her and says, how did you know that there was a differential in these measurements? 
And she says, my father wrote a book about it years ago. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my daughter. Anyway, uh, I forgot, but it, it was to deal with the disparity between measurement from space and Earth. So remember, on Earth, every mean sea level is around the world is at a different elevation. And there's 100 feet. There's 22 feet between Panama and Colón in the P Panama Canal. Hence, they have to jack the boats up 90 feet to get them to fit the other side. So uh, my father worked on that, you know. So it's a very interesting. Uh, yes, there's uh, this argument could go on forever because it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think we could go on forever, couldn't we? Um, I, 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 sp I suppose perhaps we'd better wrap it up there, though. I think I, th I, th I don't think we've got any more questions for you at all, Richard. So, um, so I, I'll say well, 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 thank you very much for a very interesting talk again. Um, it's a, it's always interesting thinking about it. Uh, can can we actually see is the uh, you know, uh, where, where are the ocean levels and how do we <laughs> define a mean uh, ocean level, I think. <laughs> so, uh, well, that, that, so that, thank you once again for the, uh, for the uh, talking to us. And thank you for setting it up, Stephen, so efficiently. And thanks for all you listeners out there. And I hope we can repeat this again at some future time. Thank you very much. Have a great time. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It, 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 does anyone else? Sh shall I? Shall I just stop the meeting there, or does anybody else want to talk amongst themselves, or anything? No. You, you got oh. me up at, at five o'clock this morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just you, been, you, you need to go I'm back been, to bed now. <laughs> I, I'm just, remember, I've been three. No, sorry, I've been five weeks in house. Oh no, sorry. Four weeks in hospital, two in isolation, <laughs> and I'm dying to sleep. So, <laughs> gentlemen, goodbye and thank you so much for listening. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say cheerio to everybody. Cheerio. Thanks for uh, all coming.